The Buffalo Bills are AFC East champs once again for a fourth consecutive season with their Week 18 win over the Miami Dolphins. We're breaking it all down today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are, those of you who never miss a single episode. I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Victory Monday to you. The Buffalo Bills defeated the Miami Dolphins 21 to 14, improved to 11 and 6, won the AFC East, and claimed the number two seed in the AFC playoffs. Folks, they did it. They pulled it off. They climbed all the way out of the hole, and win the AFC East for a fourth consecutive season. Now, this game, to me, was emblematic of this season. It was just like the season that unfolded. It started really ugly with tons of missed opportunities, but in the end, they pulled it off. After Week 12, the Bills were 6-6, six and six, and the number 11 seed in the AFC playoffs. After 45 minutes of this Dolphins game, the Bills were down 14-7 to with missed opportunities left and right. But then the fourth quarter of the season came, and the Bills won five in a row to close out the year, win the division, and are the number two seed in the AFC playoffs. Just like the fourth quarter of the game against the Miami Dolphins came, and the Bills scored. 14 unanswered to win the game. The 2023 Buffalo Bills are truly a resilient football team. Now, we're going to talk more specifically about this win, but I think it was so interesting to see the parallels between the season and how it finished and this particular game and how it finished. I always say you got to play them all. You got to play them all and see what happens. The Bills were six and six. The Jaguars were eight and three. The Jaguars had a head to head win over the Buffalo Bills for a tiebreaker. The Jaguars finished the season nine and seven. The Bills finished the season 11 and six. You got to play them all. You got to play them all. And it was a winding path. But it finishes kind of how you hoped it would in terms of, oh, the Bills are the AFC East champs. They're the number two seed in the AFC. All is right in the world. Tell that to yourself after week 12 when the Bills are six and six. All right, let's talk more about this game. And I want to start with the unlikely heroes. Ken Sherfield, Deontay Hardy, Taylor Rapp, Balin Spector, Dane Jackson. Yeah, Josh Allen made some great plays, and Dalton Kincaid, Stephon Diggs, all of that was really good. But how about those guys? Let's start with those guys. With the AFC East on the line, huge seeding implications, those guys came through. Let's start with Trent Sherfield. The dude hauls in the first touchdown of the game for the Bills. Was the RPO glance route. It bounces off of a Dolphins player's helmet. Goes up in the air. And Trent Sherfield makes an excellent adjustment and great toe-tap catch in the back of the end zone for a touchdown. Winds up with three catches for 24 yards on four targets. Gabe Davis gets injured in this game. We know that while Gabe Davis may be pretty up and down when it comes to production, he's on the field almost every snap for the Bills on offense. And so... Trent Sherfield not only coming through with three catches, 24 yards, including that touchdown, 
he fills in the Gabe Davis role and has to block and do all those miscellaneous things that are required of Gabe Davis, including things like setting the rub route on the Dawson Knox touchdown reception. So Trent Sherfield, you're one of your unlikely heroes. Deontay Hardy, another unlikely hero. 96-yard punt return for a touchdown. The longest punt return in team history. And I remember how I was feeling when I was watching this game. The Bills are down 14-7. to It's the third quarter. And I'm just sitting there watching this game in fear of Miami going up two scores. Well, Deontay Hardy had other plans. He ties the game up at 14 with a 96-yard punt return for a touchdown, a player that's been quiet this season, mostly a disappointment. Same thing about Trent Sherfield coming through in a big, big moment. How about Taylor Rapp? The game ceiling interception, which was his second pass breakup of the night. Taylor Rapp has been mostly a player I've been frustrated with this season. But in a big, big, big moment, the guy comes up with the game ceiling interception and the Bills kneel out the game. How about Balen Spector? Tyrell Dotson gets hurt towards the middle end of the second quarter. Spector comes in, makes four impactful tackles. You don't feel like he's a liability out there. We'll talk about it down uh, in a moment here, but down the stretch, the Bills defense truly tightened the screws, and Balen Spector is on the field for that. And, of course, he's playing over Dorian Williams. How about Dane Jackson? Rasul Douglas gets hurt in this game. Dane Jackson steps in, has a massive pass breakup, huge tackle in the second half, and he was a big part of this defense tightening the screws and getting the win. So a reserve corner in Dane Jackson, a reserve linebacker in Balen Spector, who's played less than 10 snaps of defense in his career, Taylor Rapp, Deontay Hardy, Trent Sherfield, the depth of this football team stepped up and made, I mean, huge plays, huge plays. Things you love to see. Hat tip to Brandon Bean and hat tip to Sean McDermott for having these guys ready to go to come through in this moment. Speaking of Sean McDermott, this man deserves flowers. I was really frustrated with Sean McDermott this season after that Eagles loss and seeing the defense kind of get worked and give up some leads and just kind of feeling like the team just was not, couldn't get out of its own way. But my goodness, did this man pull all the right levers down the stretch, of course, starting with the offensive coordinator switch to bring in Joe Dorsey to, or excuse me, Joe Brady to replace Ken Dorsey, but then just how the defense is played. This defense has been so freaking good down the stretch. Obviously, a big five-game win streak. And what this defense has done during that streak is incredible. Four of the last five games, the Bills defense needed a stop at the end to win it. And they got it all four times against Kansas City, against the Chargers, against the Patriots, and again against the Dolphins. Health Kansas City, Dallas, and Miami all under 20 points. And Dallas and Miami are the top two scoring offenses in the NFL. During this stretch, this five-game win streak after the bye, the Bills' defense is allowing an average of 16.8 points per game and 277 yards per game. Four consecutive AFC East titles, five consecutive playoff appearances, five consecutive double-digit seasons. Hat tip to Sean McDermott. Hat tip to Sean McDermott in a big way. All right. That's how I want to start this conversation. I want to kind of get into this journey that we've been on and give some shout outs to some very, very unlikely heroes. And in just a moment, we're going to really talk more about the defense. We'll talk about the offense and Josh Allen. We've got a lot to get to here. So be sure to stick with us. But folks, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to be certain that you have as many top-tier candidates as possible to interview. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. 
LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. And hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats right now and might not have the time or resources to hire. Well, thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. And they even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. So be sure to post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, folks, let's talk a little bit more about this defense. And my goodness, did they tighten the screws. The second half defense was exceptional. Again, keeping in mind, this is this is the number one scoring offense in the NFL at their place, right? South Florida, the Hard Rock Stadium, number one scoring offense. What Sean McDermott's defense did down the stretch was incredible. The Dolphins get five drives in the second half. Five. What'd they do with them? When they're up 14-7, to seven, they go three and out. They go four and out. They go three and out. They go three and out. And then they go four and out. Of course, the last four and out, the game is clinched by Taylor Rapp with the game ceiling interception. Five drives, three and out, four and out, three and out, three and out, four and out. Miami had 100 rushing yards in the first half. What'd they finish with? 108. Talk about making adjustments. The Dolphins ran 17 plays in the second half. Take a bow, Sean McDermott. And you're doing this with Balen Specter and Dane Jackson on the field. Heck of a job. Heck of a job. You limit the Miami Dolphins in the game to 14 total points. Again, the number one scoring offense in the NFL. In two games against you, they scored 20 and 14, so 34 points in two games against the Dolphins this year. Miami was 4 of 10 on third down. You can live with that. Only 275 total yards. Miami made it to the red zone one time. And you had two takeaways. Of course, the first drive, Christian Benford makes a great interception. And then Taylor Rapp, of course, the massive, massive interception. Just a great job by this defense. Deserve a lot of credit. Especially as the offense, of course, did some really good things. But certainly had some very costly blunders. I think you can look at this game and look back on this game and Maybe ask yourself the question, how did the Bills not win this game by multiple touchdowns, right? Well, the answer is they they squandered a lot of great opportunities early on, but this was a game that the Bills were really in control of, lopsided pretty much everywhere but the scoreboard. The Bills win by seven, but they have like 200 more total yards. They double them up on time of possession. This was a game where it, it was really about the Bills' offense missing opportunities that allowed this game to stay pretty close. Of course, the Bills' defense deserves a lot of credit, and the offense certainly made some huge plays down the stretch. But as we shift our focus in this conversation to the offense, there is really some good and some bad. Let's start with the bad, and we'll finish on a high note. The bad is that you had tons of missed opportunities, tons of them. Starting on the very first drive, 12 plays, 79 yards, Josh Allen coming out and playing exactly the game I thought he needed to play. Taking the underneath stuff, they're running the ball efficiently. It looks good. I'm feeling great. I feel like Josh Allen's got the right stuff in this game. And then you get down inside the five-yard line, and the second down play is the incomplete pass to Dawson Knox, which was the most obvious pass interference call you're ever going to see that wasn't called. I mean, just, just so obvious. I know that as a Bills fan, it's it's hard to like have an unbiased look at at penalties, but come on. I mean, that was obviously pass interference. The next play is the interception. Josh Allen throws it. He thought Gabe Davis was going to stop on the route. Gabe Davis runs to space. It's an interception. A really goofy play. 
missed opportunity for, I mean, I'd love to see what that drive looks like if they call the pass interference and you get first and goal from the one, I'd say that's probably a good chance to score a touchdown. Well, you get no points. The very next drive, you're moving the ball once again. And the the drive starts off pretty bad. Josh Allen misses that deep shot to Stefan Diggs, who absolutely cooked Jalen Ramsey on the play. Josh overthrows him by like five yards. Now you respond, you get the 46-yard catch and run to Khalil Shakir. But then on second and five, at the plus 38, Dalton Kincaid drops the ball. It would have been a first down. And on third down, it's a three-yard scramble by Josh Allen. Could have been a first down, but Osiris Torrance can't sustain his block. And then you go for it on fourth down, and Josh Allen throws an interception in the end zone on back-to-back drives. Now, that interception was actually kind of good because if you just threw an incomplete pass there, they're going to get the ball back around the 35. So it cost Miami you know, 15 yards of field position, but it's it's a momentum thing, right? You threw a pick, and now you've thrown picks on back-to-back drives, and you're just wondering if this is just going to be a bozo game from Josh Allen. Then you get to that fiasco at the end of the sec, uh, end of the first half, end of the second quarter, where you're moving the ball once again. Ten plays, 73 yards. You wind up getting no points. Highlighted on the drive by James Cook dropping another touchdown pass. I mean, how many touchdowns did that guy drop down this stretch? Four? Insane. Or easy catches. And then on the last play, you have no timeouts. Josh Allen throws short of the end zone. Ty Johnson gets tackled at one at the one and time runs out before you can get any points. These are blunders midway through the third quarter. Another great drive, 13 plays, 49 yards. You're down in the red zone. Osiris Torrance gets dusted for a sack. Josh Allen fumbles and Miami takes possession of the ball while you're threatening to score once again. And Josh can't fumble that ball. Like Cyrus Torrance gets beat by Christian Wilkins. Okay, that happens. But dude, did you you didn't have to fumble? It's in your face. It's not a backside hit. And then, like you you had that opportunity. I love the decision to go for it on the fourth and one at the end of the game, running the tush push. But where were the tush pushers? Like there's those guys got to get and push. They they were watching the play. So you had these huge mistakes that left so many points on the board that were like also momentum swings throughout it, but you also made some huge plays. When it comes to the good of this offense, even throughout those miscues, you move the ball seemingly at will. The Miami just didn't have any answers for your offense other than you beating yourself. Josh Allen, 30 for 38. 359 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions, of course. Has 67 yards on the ground. The guy goes out and has 426 yards of offense. I mean, and that's a really, I mean, 30 of 38 for for 359. That's really good. And then you're getting the ball to your playmakers. Khalil Shakir, six catches, 105 yards on six targets. The efficiency to Khalil Shakir just continues to be off the charts, the yards after catch, it's all really good. How about Stefan Diggs? We we finally felt like we saw a good Stefan Diggs game here. Seven for 87 on eight targets. The only target he didn't haul in was the, th- I mean, I Josh, Josh can't miss that throw. Can't miss that throw. He did, though. He did, and he hit him on a deep shot down the left sideline, which was awesome, right? So you saw Stefan Diggs. It felt like, a, like Stefan Diggs again, right? It's good to see. Dalton Kincaid was awesome in this game. Seven catches, 84 yards, and eight targets. Some massive receptions, some good stuff down the field. It's nice to see that becoming more of a part of his game. And he's been really good the last couple of weeks. Dawson Knox has a touchdown catch. And I already mentioned Trent Sherfield. So you did good things here on offense. You scored, well, you only scored 20, you scored 21 points, seven of which comes courtesy of special teams, but 26 first downs. You're nine of 15 on third down, nearly 500 yards of offense, 473. You hold the ball for 38 minutes in terms of time of possession. You do a lot of good things here, but then you only score 14 points on offense. And what's the to me the big black eye here is two of five in the red zone. Three empty possessions in the red zone is is terrible. I mean, again, a game that was a seven point game where Miami had a chance to tie the game at the end, but really wasn't that close. 
really wasn't that close, but kind of had some miscues that kept them in it, but then your defense really kept them out of getting into it. And of course your offense did come through in some big moments. Obviously Josh Allen did some really fun things in this game. Some, some crazy scrambles. The third and 13 run was unbelievable. And, and to see how many Miami dolphins were right in the vicinity of Josh Allen, where he still got like four yards to go and he just barrels through them all and gets the first down. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's so big for momentum that reminds you of what how special Josh Allen is and how he can carry a football team. It's awesome to see. Really awesome to see. All right, we got a bunch more to get to here in segment three. I want to uh, offer some thoughts on Von Miller and Leonard Fournette, talk about the injuries, talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers, 2024 opponents. We got plenty more to get to here, folks, so be sure to stick with us. But folks, as the regular season is wrapping up, there's still plenty of time to get in on the action over at FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. I love the app. It's super easy to use, and there's a ton of different things that you can bet on, like live same-game parlays. They have the new Explore tab for you to find unique bets. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find the popular parlays and so much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, I want to talk about a couple of random notes here. Um, Von Miller, active for this game made the zero impact I could have told you he would have had if he was active for this game. Kind of crazy to see him on the field like at the end of the game where it's that last drive, Taylor Rapp winds up picking off a pass, but he's out there and it's like, what is going on here? He's just not effective. And I I think maybe the Bills knew that they were clinched, right, going into the game with the Jacksonville loss. Um, and you, you want to put Von Miller out there. And I think you're just, you're hoping to see that it clicks and that you can get Von, um, back, but it's just not, I don't think it's going to happen this year. I just, I think this is a more of, we'll see in 2024 fingers crossed that you can matter in 2024, but every snap that he's on the field, it feels like you're playing defense with 10. He's just so ineffective. So he winds up being active over Kingsley Jonathan. I'd rather have Kingsley Jonathan. Leonard Fournette uh, called off the practice squad for this one, and the significant domino here is that Latavius Murray was inactive, and I think we can all agree that that was the right decision. Leonard Fournette, he didn't make any crazy plays in this game, but he's a lot more fresh than Latavius Murray, and I think that matters a lot. He, he's physical, and you know he takes those one, two-yard runs, and he kind of guts them out for a three, right, and gets those gets those 30 yards, which is kind of a it's it's a shame because I, the Bills' rushing offense is I really love the design and intent of it. The, the backs just don't win after contact with any consistency. And you know James Cook, um, again, he kind of gets what's blocked for him, and he you know if he's got space, he can be shifty and make some moves. But these aren't guys that really survive a lot of contact. And it's nice to see Leonard Fournette to be able to come in and provide that element. Certainly, Ty Johnson has done that concussion in this game, however. But Latavius Murray just feels like. It feels like the wheels fell off this year on him. They started off really effective, and then down the stretch, you can just you can just feel it game by game that he was running out of gas. So I think it's the right move to have Leonard Fournette getting those opportunities over Latavius Murray. But I don't think this was James Cook's best game, and not that he was terrible, but there were just times where it's just like he, he couldn't make somebody miss in space, wasn't running with a ton of urgency and convictions. And it, it, James is a hard player for me because he, he he's grown so much, and I like him. But then there's just other times where there's a you feel like there's a physical dynamic that's just kind of missing from him uh, from time to time. And so it's nice to see a, a, a compliment come in and get, and get some of those tough yards. Injuries are certainly a, a lasting thing from this game. Rasul Douglas, Tyrell Dotson, Gabe Davis, Ty Johnson, all injured, did not finish the game. Uh, real quick on their specific issues, uh, Rasul Douglas knee injury. Uh, Dane Jackson said after the game that or I, I don't know if it was Dane Jackson or Rasul Douglas, but somehow it came through that Rasul said he can go back in and play. And Dane said, look, if you're not 100 percent, I got you. So it's nice to know that like, like he at least said he could go back and finish if he needed to. Obviously, his status for next week is going to be important 
um, against Pittsburgh with Mason Rudolph and, uh, and George Pickens has been really hot for them lately. So I, I, I somewhat feel good about that one. Tyrell Dotson, I, I have no idea here. Shoulder injury. Um, he didn't finish the game, got injured in the second quarter, did not finish. Hopefully he can get back. No idea what the extent there is. Gabe Davis goes down with a non-contact knee injury. Don't know what the extent is, but non-contact and knee injury, never good. Never really was like a moment where he was writhing in pain on the field, but uh, you see the non-contact injury. He goes to the sideline, and you know the next thing you know, he's got a hat and a sweatshirt on. Uh, so we'll see what his status is. And then Ty Johnson, a concussion. We know what the deal is there. It's a matter of clearing concussion protocol or not. So that's the injury status. So the Bills went into this game really healthy. They come out with four known injuries, and then you just never know what else happened along the way. I guess we'll learn uh, more about that Monday and and then probably even more on Wednesday when the team has its first practice. Uh, The Bills' wild card round opponent is the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, 10-7 and football team. The Bills will host them. One o'clock kickoff uh, Sunday at Highmark Stadium. So it's nice to be home, of course. And I think Pittsburgh's the team you'd want to play. I know that they found a little magic here over the last three weeks with Mason Rudolph as their quarterback. Um, And we'll talk more about the Steelers this week. And I respect every team in the NFL, but this is the playoffs. And I think if you could pick a team to host in the playoffs, you'd pick pick Pittsburgh, right? That'd be the choice. Their third quarterback, Mason Rudolph, you know, an offense that has found something a little bit lately, but has mostly been a bumbling offense all season long. Defensively, they have some good things going on, but we saw you know T.J. Watt got injured in that game, uh, the last game they played against the Ravens, and I would find it to be unlikely that he plays this week. Um, we'll see if Minka Fitzpatrick gets back this week. So, I Mike Tomlin's going to have his crew ready to go, but at the same time, I mean, come on, this is this the Bills are opening up as nearly ten point favorites. We'll talk it. We'll talk more in depth. I'll study the Steelers this week, but this feels like a good draw for the Buffalo Bills at home. Of course, the Miami Dolphins, they're now the sixth seed in the AFC. They go to Kansas City in what's supposed to be very, very cold uh, situation out there, which, you know, that was a big deal for Miami. They wanted to win this game, of course, to win the division, but you know, now they got to play road games and they're going to have to go to Kansas City. And if they win that game, they got to go to Baltimore. Right. So it's a tough path for Miami here in the postseason as they've, you know, they blew a three, a three game lead with five to play. They, that's, I mean, it was right there for them. So, you know, they've had some injuries along the way, but uh, unfortunate end of the season for them. Uh, one other interesting note here is that the 2024 opponents have been set. Uh, now we don't know when these games will be played in what order. But we do know the opponents that the Bills will play because these things are cyclical uh, every year, and they're based on uh, some of them. Three of the games every year are based on where you finish in your division. And so now that the season, the regular season is, is complete, we know the 2024 opponents. So next year at home, the Bills will host the Patriots, Dolphins, Jets, of course, the Jaguars, Titans, Cardinals, 49ers, and then they host the Chiefs. Uh, so Patrick Mahomes is coming to Western New York um, next year in the regular season and perhaps in the playoffs. If the Bills win and the Chiefs win, the Bills will host the Chiefs next week in the playoffs. That'll be a guaranteed situation. Um, if the Bills would have lost to Miami and played the second place team in the West, they would have played the Raiders. So a consolation prize, if there are any for the Miami Dolphins, is they don't have to play the Chiefs next year. Instead, they have to play the Raiders. The Bills away schedule, of course, the AFC East at Patriots, Dolphins, and Jets. They go to Houston, to the Colts, to the Rams, to the Seahawks, and then they go to Baltimore and to Detroit. And so Baltimore and Detroit were the two games up in the air based on where everybody finished in the division. And so the Bills will go to Baltimore and to Detroit. Meanwhile, the Dolphins will go to Cleveland and to Green Bay. And so you never know what 2024 is going to hold and what these teams look like, but it's always fun to kind of make yourself aware of who the opponents are. I normally, at the end of these podcasts, I, I recap my predictions, although I only gave you one prediction this week, and it was that I thought the Bills would win, and 
Through that, I gave a pretty spirited conversation about why I thought the Bills would win the game. And a lot of that played out, you know, in terms of why I thought they would win the game, but then also why I was afraid uh, because I was concerned about maybe how some of the missed opportunities in the passing game would manifest themselves. I was worried about Josh Allen, you know, making some mistakes and chasing some plays. I was worried about the interior offensive line. Like a lot of that showed up. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the reasons why I thought the Bills would have an advantage in this game wound up prevailing in terms of how the Bills defense was playing and ultimately how the opportunities in the, in the offense would be there for the Bills. And so while they got in their own way for a fair amount of the game, it also wound up working out with their consistent ability to move the football and then, of course, ultimately make the necessary plays to win the game. Uh, next up for this podcast, we're gonna our next two episodes will be the herd mentality and the all twenty two review. Uh, I'll probably do herd mentality first because it's easy to get that taken care of, and then I can just spend a lot of time in the tape. And so that's probably what'll happen. And then I'll spend all day Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning in the all twenty two film, uh, which is another great opportunity for me to remind you to join the Locked On Bills subtext community. Super fun thing that we have going on where you can have one, one-on-one one text messaging conversations with me, but you also get my in-game analysis. So all during the Bills-Dolphins game, pretty much after every drive, I sent out a text letting everybody know what I was thinking, what I'm seeing. Uh, you get my first reaction to all major Bills news through, through a text message, but then also you get access to our Discord channel. And this is really cool because after the Bills games, I spend all day in the tape and I put clips in the, in the Discord channel where you can, you know, they're like a minute or two, and I'll talk over what I'm seeing and breaking down the plays for you. So would love for you to be part of that. So if you join our subtext, that means you get into our Discord channel for free. Um, and so if you want to join, there's a link in today's show notes. Click on the show notes. There's a link to join the Lockdown Bill subtext community. Uh, also, I understand that the international listeners, you cannot join subtext. It's not available, unfortunately, but I can get you into the Discord channel. Send me an email joe marino 65 at gmail.com you can get into the discord see the film clips and we got hundreds of bills fans in there like almost 500 bills fans in there We're talking bills talking sabers talking life fitness nutrition and of course the film clips so come and be part of that folks enjoy it the bills are afc east champions they're the two seed it's a victory monday should be all smiles all around and it'll be a fun week on the podcast as we uh obviously break down this game a little bit more with the All-22 review, we get into the big questions and her mentality, but then we focus in on the Pittsburgh Steelers and get ready for uh, what's hopefully four more games to go for the Buffalo Bills this season. So make sure that you are subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great Victory Monday. Go Bills! And I look forward to catching up with you again real, real soon.